This series of videos is intended to explain what Git is, how you use it, and how you can then use it in conjunction with a developer environment like MPLabX or with an online repository like GitHub for when you're working with a group of people on a coding project. Git is a program that, if you're working on your own, gives you version control. What that means is that as you're coding, it's good practice to save iterations of your code as you go along. That way, you've got an archive of working code, and if you need to revert back to an earlier version of the code, you could do so easily. The problem with that is that it's a bit of a hassle to continually stop and save your code under a different file name. Git gives you a faster way to do that. It allows you to very quickly take a snapshot of your code and record what has changed. When you're working with a group of people, such as on a group project or on an open source code project, you can use Git in combination with an online repository like GitHub in order to share code between people. There's some nice functionality that allows you to merge code from multiple people without introducing code conflicts, and also to test out code fully before you commit to adding it to your final project. So first, here's a high-level sketch of what Git is. It's based on a threefold model. The working area is just the space that you always work in when you're working on a coding project. These are the folders that you keep your code and other files in, and also the programs you use to help build your project. So the working area is exactly the space that you occupy when you're building a project without Git. What you use Git for is to capture a series of snapshots of your project as you're working on it at different points in time. The permanent record of all of your snapshots are going to live in what's called the repository. The repository is the most important part of Git. You should make a new repository for each new code project that you create. In between the two is what's called a staging area. This is where you put files that you intend to commit into the repository later. The reason why this exists is that the repository is a bit of a one-way street. You could put stuff into it, you can't very well take it out. The staging area is more fluid. You can put files into it, you can also take them out. You can put a file in, add some changes, add some more changes later, and then commit it to the repository when you're ready. Now to begin with, I'm going to be teaching you how to use Git from the command line in a terminal. And I know that working from the command line is a little intimidating and ugly, but once you understand how to use Git from the command line, it becomes really easy to understand how you use it in conjunction with, for example, MPLabX or GitHub. So learning how to use Git from the command line is a really good foundation for us to start from. So first, we're going to want to get Git installed on your computer. So go ahead and Google Git and click on that first link, git-scm.com. Next, you're going to want to click on the Downloads link. Next, you should click the link for the correct version of Git for your operating system, Mac, Windows, or Linux. Save the .exe file to your computer. Then you want to open the file in its current location. This is what it looked like when I did it in Firefox. And now you want to run that .exe file. That will start the Git installer, and there's a whole bunch of screens we're going to need to go through, so I'll go through them quickly with you here. For most of them, I'm just going to hit the default Next. So here, I look through their license, and then I click Next. I accept the default folder, and I click Next. I accept the default components, and click Next. I accept the Start menu folder by clicking Next. And here's something worth stopping and paying attention to. They note that Git's default editor is a program called Vim, but that it's only used for historical reasons and that a lot of people find it harder to use. Luckily, they let you choose another one. I tried to select Notepad++, but the program wouldn't let me. So I ended up using something called Nano instead, and it has worked just fine for me. On the next screen, I accept the defaults by clicking Next. And again, I click Next. And on the next screen again, and the next screen, and the next, and finally we're ready to install. So other than the text editor, I just accepted all the defaults. The program starts installing, and then finishes. Now just so that you know, the installation I just showed you was for Windows, and when you're installing on Windows, you're going to also be installing a program called Git for Windows. This gives you a terminal in which you can access the command line. If you're installing on a Mac or on Linux, you should be able to just use the standard terminal program to access the command line. On Windows, it's a little bit messier, which is why you've got this Git for Windows program that keeps your experience the same as it would be on a different operating system. 
The good news is that the installation already installed Git for Windows for you, so you don't need to do anything else. You've already got Git for Windows as well as Git right now. Now the installation did not create a shortcut on my desktop. I had to do that myself, but you can see it up here in the corner. Double clicking on that opens up a terminal with a command line in it, and I'm gonna use that to control Git. So this is what the terminal looks like, and as you can see, the default location that it's put me in is the C drive, the users folder, and then inside that, the Jennifer folder. So that's my current location, C slash users slash Jennifer. Now, if you're not used to using the command line, here's an important command, CD. It stands for change directory, and you use it to navigate into new folders. So let's say that I want to navigate into a new location. I want to go from this default location into the desktop folder. So I would type CD desktop. When I hit enter, I get a new prompt, and that tells me my new location. I'm now in C slash users slash Jennifer slash desktop. So I've changed directory into a new folder, the desktop folder. So what do I do if I want to go up a directory, if I want to get out of this desktop folder and go back up to the Jennifer folder? The notation to go up a directory is dot dot, so two periods together. So you would type cd for change directory and then dot dot, meaning go up one directory. So when you hit enter, you again get a new prompt and that again tells you your current location. So you're back in the Jennifer directory, you've escaped out of the desktop directory. So cd dot dot takes you up a directory and cd folder name takes you into that folder. So now let's create a Git repository for a specific project. So here I've got a folder that contains several subfolders for separate projects. And in general, you would create a new Git repository for each separate project. I've also got a common folder where I keep code that I use in all of the projects. Now Git doesn't care that I've got some code in my lab one folder and some code in my common folder. It doesn't care how the project actually fits together. It only keeps track of objects, that is to say files, and whether they've changed. So I'm gonna have one Git repository in my lab one folder. I'll have a completely separate one in my common folder, even though I use some of the code from common in my lab one project. So again, Git doesn't care about functionality, it only cares about files and whether or not they have changed. So let's go into the lab one folder now and create the Git repository for it via the command line in the terminal. So now I've clicked into my lab one folder and as you can see, there are only two objects in here. There's a hello world.c file and also a folder created by mplabx for my project. I could track both of these objects with Git or any number of files inside this lab one folder. But to keep things clear for you, I'm only gonna track one file, the hello world file. So to do that, we need to go down to the command line in the terminal and change directory into the lab one folder there as well. So I'll start doing that now. I'll type cd documents to get into the documents folder, hit enter, and then I'll type cd appside 1299. And because there's a space in that name, I have to put quotes around it. Hit enter again. And next I'm gonna go up two directories at once just to show you that you can do that. So I type cd, open quotes, my projects 2018, slash, lab one, close quotes. So the slash allows me to go in two directories at once. I hit enter, and now I'm in the lab one folder where I want to create my Git repository. To initialize a Git repository in this folder, all I need to do is type git init, and then hit enter. Now there's two things I'd like you to notice have happened here. One is that in the terminal, it tells me that it has initialized an empty Git repository in my lab one folder. The other is that up here in my lab one folder, you can see that there's a hidden file that has been created called .git. I've got my folder options set up so that you can see hidden files right now. Normally you would not see this, even though it's there. So now the Git repository has been created, but we should configure it quickly before we continue on. To configure the username, you would type git config user.name and then your first and last name inside quotes, and then hit enter. To configure the email address, you would type git config user.email and then your email address inside quotes, and then hit enter. Just so you know, if you plan to use the online repository GitHub, then this email address must be the same one that you used to sign up for your GitHub account. Also, if you'd like to skip having to configure every Git repository you make on your computer, there's a way to do this globally. Instead of typing what I have above, you would instead type git config dash dash global user dot name and then your name inside quotes and 
git config dash dash global user dot email and then your email address inside quotes. And this will ensure that when you create a Git repository in future on your computer, that it will already be configured with your name and email. To check whether a repository has been configured or not, you can type git config user.name or user.email with nothing after it and then hit enter. If the repository has already been configured, it will display the stored value for you. So the next thing I'm going to show you is how to actually use Git, how to add files to the staging area and then commit them to the repository. But in order to do that, I'm going to need to teach you about six different commands. So I'm going to give you a quick overview first so that things are hopefully not too confusing. So remember that Git works on this threefold model. You work on your code in your regular working area. And when you're ready to take a snapshot of it, you add it to the staging area and then you commit it to the repository. So let's look at the commands for doing that. To add files to the staging area, you type git add and then the file name. You add your files one by one. To commit files to the repository, you type git commit and then you should add a message explaining what that commit is. So you add dash m and then your message in quotes. When you make a commit to the repository, you are committing all of the files that were in the staging area at once. Now you would like to know what's going on inside the staging area and the repository. You don't want to hold all that information in your head. You'd like the system to be able to give you updates about what's going on. To check what's going on inside the staging area, type git status. To check what's going on inside the repository, type git log. Another thing that would be useful to have would be a way to check what's different between the working area and the staging area so that you know whether you need to update a file before you commit everything to the repository. To check differences between files in the working area and files in the staging area, type git diff. It would also be useful to be able to check differences between files in the staging area and files in the repository. To do so, type git diff dash dash staging. So let's summarize that. We've got three commands associated with the staging area and three commands associated with the repository. Git status gives you information about what's in the staging area. Git log gives you information about what's in the repository. Git add file name adds a file to the staging area from the working area. Git commit dash m message commits all the files from the staging area to the repository. Git diff shows you the differences between the files in the working area and the files in the staging area. And git diff dash dash staged shows you the differences between the files in the staging area and the files in the repository. So now let's go back to the command line in the terminal and see what this looks like in practice. So at this point, I have files in my working area, but I haven't added anything to the staging area and I haven't committed anything to the repository. So my first step would be to add something to the staging area. But before I do that, let's first check the status of what's in the staging area to see what that tells me. So I type git status and hit enter, and this is what I get. So it's telling me I have two untracked files, my hello world.c file and my hello world.x folder from mplabx. As I mentioned, I'm only going to commit the hello world.c file to my repository, but I can commit as many files as I want to. So to add my file to the staging area, I'm going to type git add hello world.c and hit enter. It doesn't look very interesting, so I'll use git status again to find out what's going on with the repository now. So I type git status again and enter, and now it's reporting something different than it did before. It's still saying that there's an untracked file. That's my hello world.x folder. However, it's also saying that there's now changes to be committed. That's due to my hello world.c file, which is now listed as a new file in the staging area. So let's check what's going on with the repository now. To do that, I type git log and hit enter, but it just tells me there are no commits yet. So that's what we'll do next. We'll commit everything in the staging area to the repository. To do that, you type git commit dash m and then a short message in quotes. And I've just added a short message that says that I am committing my original hello world.c code to the repository. I click enter and it gives me a short summary of that information. So now let's see what happens when I type git log in order to check on the state of the repository. So this time when I type git log and hit enter, it lists one commit in the repository. It lists my commit message. It also lists the author of the commit and the date and time that the commit happened on. 
There's also this big long string of characters up at the top. That's essentially the name of this commit, so it's an ID number. There's also something here that says head to master. That will make more sense when you learn about how to branch your code, which I won't be discussing in this video, but rather in the next video in the series. So we've used git log to find out what's happening with our repository. Let's use git status again to find out what's going on in the staging area now that we've made our commit. So we type git status and hit enter. It still says that there's an untracked file. That's my hello world.x folder but it says nothing about the hello world.c file anymore because I've already committed those changes. Until I change my hello world.c file, there's nothing to commit. So that's what we'll do next. We'll make some changes in the hello world.c file. So now I've opened my hello world.c file and I'm gonna scroll down because there are some typos in this file. So the underscore delays command should actually be underscore delay with no S. So I'll fix those typos now. And then I'll save my changes, and then we'll go back to the terminal, and we're gonna use the git status command again to find out what's going on with the staging area now that we've saved some changes in our working area. So I type that in, and when I hit enter, it now says that there are changes not staged for commit on that hello world.c file. So it knows that I saved some changes to my hello world.c file, and I would have to add that file to the staging area again in order to change this message. But before we do this, we may as well use this git diff command in order to see what the differences are between the working area and the staging area. So I'll type git diff and hit enter, and now it gives me quite a bit of information. So it gives me a few lines of code just before the changes that I made, and a few lines of code just after the changes I made, and in between, it shows me in red what those lines of code are in the staging area, and then below it, in green, what those lines of code are in my hello world.c file in the working area. So it's showing me both versions, what's in the staging area and what's in the working area. So we know that we have changes that need to be added to the staging area, so let's do that now. We type git add hello world.c and hit enter, and we may as well use git diff again to see how it changes this output that we saw above. So we type git diff again, hit enter, and this time it doesn't show us anything because there are now no changes between what's in the working directory and what's in the staging area. By adding hello world.c again, we've made those two files identical. However, we now know that there's gonna be differences between what's in the staging area and what's in the repository. So let's check on those differences also. We type git diff dash dash staged in order to check the differences between the staging area and the repository. We hit enter and we see exactly the differences we would expect to see, which are our differences between our first commit and our current version of hello world.c, which is in both the working area and the staging area right now. So let's commit these changes to the repository. We type git commit dash m and then a short message explaining that I've fixed some typos. And by the way, it's always a good idea to do separate commits for different types of changes to your code. What I mean by that is that you could, for example, fix some typos and then add a new function to your code, add them both to the staging area, and then commit them to the repository at the same time. However, you don't want to do that because if you ever decide you want to roll back the code to an earlier version that didn't have the function, you'd also be reintroducing your typos. So it's much better to do a separate commit for fixing typos and then a separate commit for adding the function so that if you need to roll back a feature, you can do it more precisely. We hit enter and it tells us it has updated the repository. If we type git diff dash dash staged now, it has nothing to report because we've committed all changes to the repository now. And if we type git log in order to check what's going on with the repository, we now see both of our commits listed. The original one where we committed hello world.c to the repository and the second one that we did just now where we fixed typos. That concludes the content of this video. In my next video, I'm gonna be talking about how you use Git in conjunction with a developer application like MPLAB X or an online repository like GitHub. I'll also talk about how you branch code. Branching is a skill that could have been discussed in this video also, but it's more critical when you're using Git in a group project with other people. Branching the code basically means that you make a copy of it that you can then work on, and when you've got it working, you can merge it back into the original copy. This is useful when you're working with more than one person because all of you can branch the code, work on it separately, and when you're done working on your separate pieces, you can then merge everybody's work back into one project. 
As I said, I'll discuss this more in the next video in this series. Thank you for watching.